Well, as a dog walker, the house on Pooh Corner sometimes doesn't really deal with the logins and the Cena song. But on the uh, September 19, 1991 airing of later Bob Costas, that song and lots more got discussed with Kenny Loggins. Check it out. It is not shite. Thanks for staying up later. When you talk about songs like Danny's song and Whenever I Call You Friend and Footloose, What a Fool Believes, This Is It, My Music, Your Mama Don't Dance, you're talking about songs that Kenny Loggins did either on his own or uh, in collaboration with others. I think it's fair to say that uh, you've got an audience that dates back at least to the 70s, probably overlaps into the late 60s and now mm, continues. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll just confine 71. it. 71s, 80s, yeah. 90s. How has it changed for you during that period of time? And are the same faces in the audience? You hit me with the simple ones right off the top. How has it changed? Um, I feel actually a, a circle happening here that what people were craving musically in the early 70s, I think is starting to come back around again. It's, and, and I'm not talking about stylistically or musically necessarily, although uh, we're seeing a lot of unplugged things happening now, what they're calling unplugged was basically acoustic music. Mm -hmm. um, although it's interesting to hear heavy metal stuff unplugged, it becomes like a completely, completely different sound. And, um, but I think that people are craving um, music with some emotional content again. Where you can actually yeah. understand the lyrics? Yeah, or, or where you're moved by the lyrics, you know, uh, let alone understand them. I mean, you know, even in those days, I could, couldn't understand much of what Jagger was saying anyway, and it didn't matter. But um, to, have, to have music that is emotionally impacting, that, that touches you in some way, where you say, God, I, I, I wished I could have said that myself. But that, I think that was what was happening. I was lucky in that my career started in the early 70s where there was a craving for artists who had something to say and who could say it melodically. Um, and then that then the late 70s, what they call the 70s, they, they musically, uh, if you watch uh, the k -Tel ads and stuff, you'd think it was all dance music, you know, which the disco thing really happened in the mid to late 70s and sort of categorized the 70s as being dance, uh, Saturday Night Fever stuff. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't really. The early 70s was probably the carryover of the late 60s. And that notion of the, the troubadour type mm -hmm. performer, mm -hmm. uh, the solo Singer, singer song songwriter, writer. right, yeah. backed by a band, but yeah. the band was nameless, mm -hmm. and it was James Taylor or right. whomever Cat out Stevens. there in front. Yeah, I remember I, I saw Cat Stevens when he was first performing at the Troubadour in Los Angeles, and it was just he and a bass player. And uh, it's very impacting when you, when you pair the music down to just the singer and his song. Tell me how you and uh, Jim Messina hooked up, and where did it peak for you? Not commercially, but uh -huh. creatively, personally. Okay. Where did it peak? Well, um, I was looking for a producer. This was late 1970. And I'd been sending my tapes around and auditioning for people, singing for everybody I could. And then I heard um, through some friends that uh, um, Jimmy Messina was looking for acts to produce. And um, so um, I contacted him and went over to his house for dinner, sang some songs, and we just started uh, trading material and decided to work together. Was it at the Troubadour in L.A. where you sort of made a breakthrough, where, uh, where audiences mm -hmm. first really responded to you? Yeah, actually, it was one of our first dates together when um, Loggins and Messina first performed uh, with Curtis Mayfield. We were an opening act for Curtis Mayfield, which is a, a strange coupling. Was that uh, yeah. at the time of Superfly or before or after? I think that or? was around that time, yeah. And um, we, we surprisingly got very strong audience response and just sort of took off from there. It was in the, in the stars. When you've had tremendous commercial success, as you did as part of Loggins and Messina or a song like Whenever I Call You Friend, which you did with Stevie Nicks, uh, do you find that the audience craves that and it's harder to break through with the new material, which may be for different mm -hmm. reasons just as important to you? No, actually, I think the audience craves <clears throat> to feel. And I think that radio craves 
what they think will sell their advertising. And so you have a, a, a somewhat of a conflict. We, we've always known that radio shoves music down our throats. They shove a particular type of music down our throats. And it's based on the demographic, you know, the age group that they're trying to reach and what that age group will buy and their commercials that they, then come on that radio station, as your show is, are aimed at the demographics of, of that listener. So suddenly we have formats getting tighter and tighter and tighter to reach a particular mm -hmm. audience. And then they run scared. They think, well, if they bought Paula Abdul last week, then we have to have Paula Abdul soundalikes this week. And it becomes a very imitative form and very difficult for artists who are trying to say something unique to break through that form. And I think that's one of the reasons why radio has become um, so, uh, well, I won't say wasteland, but, you know, it's sort of damn near a quality of being so self-limiting as to be difficult to find anything. What do you feel comfortable with or most comfortable with uh, among the list of records that had big commercial success for you? Because I'm not one of those people who believes yeah. that commercial success and quality are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're not synonymous, obviously, yeah. and then sometimes things that are really successful people yeah. rightly view with disdain. But, but yeah, no, not it's always. not always the, not always the case. I think of my successful stuff. Um, well, see, it's interesting because um, what's become my trademark tunes were not my hit records. Danny's song was a hit record for uh, Anne Murray, but is a trademark tune of mine. House of Pooh Corner from the early Lagos mm -hmm. and Messina days is a trademark tune that was never a hit. Celebrate Me Home was never a hit. Uh, so of, of the actual hit records that I've had, This Is It, I think, is the one that I feel best about uh, because emotionally I was connected to the tune and it had something to say and people were moved by it. And then the, the bonus is to have it be, you know, commercially successful at the same time becomes, um, that's where you get your cake and eat it too. You wrote that one with your father in mind, right? Right. Uh, Mike McDonald and I were writing that song and we tried three times to plug a, a boy-girl lyric onto the melody. And then uh, my, my dad was in the hospital having major surgery. And I'd had a, uh, I'd visited him that morning, the morning that Michael and I wrote the tune. And my dad and I had had a big argument about whether or not he was gonna live through the operation. And he'd pretty much made up his mind that he wasn't going to. And, um, and I, I, I just resented the fact that he was ready to give up and it didn't seem like, uh, it didn't feel to me that it was appropriate, and necessarily his time. And um, so that's what our fight was about. And then when I came in and worked with the lyric with Michael, we had certain lines that we'd already had in our back pocket. You say that maybe it's over, not if you don't want it to be. Stand up and fight. Instead, those lines we'd already had. And so when I came in after my meeting with my dad, I said, now I know what these lines are about. My mind, based on what my father and I talked about, and then it emerged from that point on. You've done a lot of uh, soundtrack work, and some mm -hmm. of it quite well recognized and mm -hmm. successful. Is that always a step down the emotional ladder, though? No. Because it's tailored for a film mm -hmm. rather than to express yourself. Yeah. Um, Footloose, for example, has its moments. It's, it's a fun song to perform. It would be like performing an old Chuck Berry tune. It's valid for what it is, you know, so that's, I'm not saying that we always have to um, uh, be in pain to be real by any means, you know, that joy is just as, as valid an emotion. What are the most affecting moments for you when people come to you and tell you what a song has meant or where they were at a certain time when they first heard it? I imagine that happens yeah, frequently. Yeah. Um, for me, um, I have people who were in life and death situations come to me and tell me that a particular song gave them hope or courage. And, and I think that's why I'm so connected into the new album, um, because that's what the record is about. And so when someone says, uh, gotta try, or this is it, or heart to heart, took them through a particularly rough time. And I've heard some incredible stories, you know, and I really appreciate that, because um, you, don't, you don't get sick of hearing that stuff. This is uh, the new album, although I guess album has album become a misnomer, right? right? As you hold up, you hold up a disc. It just seems so cold to call it the new disc or the new yeah, CD. Right. When, 
when I was in school... It's like a photo every, album. We yeah. can still say album. When I was in school, though, everybody had their albums. Mm -hmm. And they were a statement about who the person was. You know, mm -hmm. I have my albums here, and I keep them in a little slot or on the floor in a corner, and right. you go through them, and you could hold them in your hand. And, and you know a lot about that person by looking through their record collection. Yeah, and the liner notes seemed to... You know, they were more accessible than some little thing that falls out of the middle of the disc. But nonetheless, folks, you can hear <laughs> the music on the disc. And this is your daughter, obviously, in, in your arms here. Yeah, three and a half years old there, Isabella. And she makes her debut, right? Her singing debut, right? <laughs> and uh, actually, there's... I guess the family theme kind of runs through the record, because well, the record itself chronicles the last couple years of my life, and of course, family is a, is a central figure in that, you know, going through separation and divorce and, and um, sort of a transformation of who I am, my priorities. Uh, at one point... Um, um, I, I fired my manager, I had requested to, to my attorney to get me off my record label. And that was well before um, I even realized that the marriage was falling apart. It's sort of, um, if I can read your mind, it's sort of a, um, a variation of what people might call midlife crises. Mm -hmm. um, but I consider that a demeaning terminology for a moment of clarity and that what came to me um, was t a time to look at what was going on in my life and assess it in a clear place in a courageous way and eliminate what wasn't working and um, and fix what I could and keep what was so uh, it wasn't a wholesale firing of everyone and everything in my life but simultaneously with that, as those values start to be to come into uh, scrutiny, um, my wife and I started to look at our marriage. And it was at that time that we both agreed. It was actually a year after this process started. Um, but we saw all through the process that we were next. And that when it came to time to look at our marriage, we both said, we're not as happy as we should be. There's something missing here. And we had to blow it up and see where the pieces fell. I only want to go as far as you feel comfortable with this. But yeah. when you have children involved, mm -hmm. there's a complicating factor, too. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't make it easy. Um, there's a song on the album called The Real Thing. And um, the song chronicles, um, the lyric is, I did it for you and the boys because love should teach you joy and not the imitation that your mommy and daddy tried to show you. That song came out, words and music, all at once, two years before my wife and I separated, well, a year and a half before we separated, um, and was, I guess, uh, that deeper place of me, that the muse, the place I write from, coming up and looking me in the eye and saying, you know, this is happening in your life. Did people tell you, fans of yours tell you, this is good stuff, but the market for it isn't there anymore. People aren't buying records <clears throat> about this sort of thing anymore, regardless of its merit. It just isn't there anymore in large numbers. Um, no, no. I, I think it was per perhaps intimated, but I think I made it real clear right from the beginning that I didn't care about that. Um, this was a record that was coming from um, a place in me that had to speak. And if it doesn't find a market, then so be it. Um, I believe there's a market for, for this kind of music. Um, even if radio isn't uh, initially uh, eager to, to play it, because it, it doesn't sound like other people's music. Uh, which I'm so happy about. You know, all your life you, you wait for a moment where you can, as an artist, have something unique to say. And this is my moment. Obviously, you wound up in a much different place, but as a kid who grew up in the 60s, what was your original impetus to be a musician? You know, you hear a lot of guys say, yeah. even guys who go on to great artistic success mm -hmm. say, you know what the idea was? Hang around with guys I liked and meet mm -hmm. girls. Yeah. I think, yeah, especially at the beginning, when I first started learning to play the guitar, it was, I had buck teeth and big ears, and 
at the time when I first started playing, I didn't get my braces on until I was in college. So it was, it was a tough time for me to meet girls and a tough time to be uh, unattractive. And um, so the music became a place for me to hide and also a place to, to emerge. Um, I'd spend a lot of my time just alone in my room learning Beatles songs or even writing my own stuff way back then, you know, in the hopes of becoming Bob Dylan or something, you know. Um, you, you use it as a, as a vehicle to show, you know, it's the ugly duckling theory, you know. Yeah. I knew there was somebody beautiful inside and I wanted some way to, to express that to people and hopefully meet somebody who cared. Hey, Logan's new record, Leap of Faith. Time for us to leap on out of here as our half hour is up. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you later. Thank you. You're welcome.